Hi everybody, you've had plenty of time to see my title slide. I'm going to be holding a flag, flag for small mammals. There are a lot of talks about the big five all the time and not so many about the little 500. And I don't know if there are any other talks at this conference. But I'm going to be suggesting that small mammals are potentially excellent indicators of, of future environmental change. And I'm going to give two examples of a rodent and a shrew taken from master's research from two of my master's students, Arawani Nengovera and Lillian Hogoni at the University of Venda, where we were fortunately recently to be awarded a, a NRF chair on biodiversity value and change in the Vembi Biosphere Reserve. I think we're one of the only universities in the world that's located inside a biosphere reserve until anybody tells us otherwise. So we work quite closely with the Vembi Biosphere Reserve uh, NGO. So my thesis is that we should be, for early detection of, of future climate change, we should be looking at altitudinal gradients in montane species, particularly in tropical and lower altitude mountain ranges, and we should be using taxa that have a low dispersal capacity, taxa such as small mammals, and we should be looking at areas such as the Sotbansberg Mountains, which form the core of the VMB Biosphere Reserve. And so I'll be talking more about that. I know I'm talking to the converted that we all understand climate change is a reality. It's here. Warming trends are probably changes in rainfall patterns that may be just as important. So you've probably all seen these maps in the latest National Biodiversity Assessment with quite sobering predictions about the, the bioclimatic niches that of the bio diff existing biomes and how they might change under different climate change scenarios, in particularly our grass, grassland at the expense of savannah. And I'm hoping that we can use taxa such as flay rats and forest trues, Afromontane taxa, to model future climate change impacts in South African Afromontane small mammals, particularly focusing, as I said, on the Sopensburg range. And we should predict that taxa that are associated with, with grassland, grassland should experience range contractions. And those associated with savannah biome should experience expansion. We expect specialists, habitat specialists, to suffer greater range expand contractions than generalists. And populations at the edge of their distribution should suffer extinction or local extinction sooner. And temperate taxa should also show probably suffer more, more, uh, more range contractions due to warming trends than, than more subtropical species. I don't want to go into detail. We used a well-known project uh, program, Maxent. Many in the room here that are, are better at it than, I, than myself, I'm sure. So I won't go into the detail. Basically, we tried using different backgrounds for model, model calibration to avoid problems such as, as truncated responses and overfitting. And we found the best, the best um, model was using the whole of South Africa, the, the, the country limits of South Africa, Lesotho and Swaziland. And many of the things are quite standard about, about the approach that we use for the modeling. And I'll, we will also I'll talk about a bit of ground truthing that we did as well, based on data and historical data from the Sotbansberg. So this is the first example I want to use. Very briefly, these are three species of flay rats of the genus Otomus that correspond in their distributions very closely to three of our biome, current biome limits. So the Angoni flay rat is very closely associated with the more mesic savannas in the eastern half of our country, Otomus auratus. The, the flay rat is associated with grassland habitats and Artemis iriratus with fynbos habitats. Until recently, auratus and iriratus were combined into a species, Artemis iriratus sensulati. Molecular data clearly show they're distinct taxa and that they're very closely associated respectively with grassland and, and fynbos biomes. So it makes it quite a nice model to test. We also collected data from two zones of sympatry, historical zones of sympatry from Red Flay Nature Reserve in Kauteng and from the Sotbansberg, where grassland and savanna habitats come close together and we have these species occurring in sympatry. And I'm just going to mention the one a bit later. But essentially here are the model results. I'm cutting through a lot of the detail, but this is the Angoni flay rat, remember, whose distribution is associated with savanna habitats. The Maxin model for current data and the grey here shown there, and then when we project it into 2050, so the models were done using eight bioclimatic variables using the A2 emission scenarios for 2050, and what you're seeing there, the grey habitat shows the projected suitable habitat in 2050, 
And the, the, li the horizontal lines show the model changes in savanna habitats based on driver et al's uh, the national assessment, biodiversity assessment. So what you can see, hopefully, if you follow the gray, is that the, the projected distribution of the savanna species will move south and west, following very much the predictions that, that uh, vegetation biologists modeled for, for savanna, extending through much of Mpumalanga and Gauteng. So it's not surprising, but we find a 131% increase if, if we allow a dispersal, or a 22% decline if we don't allow dispersal. So the range is expected to shift quite considerably, but we're still having populations in the Stoke-Pansberg Mountains. So we come to the second species, the grassland specialist, Artemis auratus. And again, if we look at the distribution, the current models, they show very much a lot of overlap with the grassland biome, as we expect, but some of these outlying points here are not included as suitable habitat. And we find that um, in Lipopo, we shouldn't be getting the species anymore in the Sopansburg, where historically it's been collected. Or we should still find it in the Waterberg and the Falkberg Mountains. If we go forward to 2050, in this species we see quite an alarming contraction in its range. And once again, I've superimposed the 2050. This is medium risk scenario for the grasslands. A lot of contraction, mostly to the higher elevations along the escarpment. You see in Lipopo, the grasslands very much contracted um, under this scenario. And again, the populations of flay rats, possibly only restricted to the Falkberg, no longer predicted to occur in the Sotpansberg or the Waterberg. And strangely enough, this, this new sort of expansion of this range along the Indian Ocean, um, Indian Ocean uh, coastal vegetation. Finally, with the Fainbos associated species, we, that's the current model and the future model, not big differences either in limits of the biome or, or some contraction in the eastern, uh, eastern Cape here, but not really of close correspondence or big differences. So I'm going to come back to those other two species, but first of all, just mention, looking at these two rows here, this is Otomus auratus, the grassland species, and Otomus angoniensis, the savanna species. These are the response variables um, from the Maxent models, in the most important variables, so the top one being the most important. So for Otomus auratus, the temperature, the, uh, the maximum temperature in the hottest month um, decreases with, uh, I mean, the probability of the, the suitability of the habitat decreases with temperature. It, when you get to about 30 degrees, it's much too hot for these temperate species. So there's an inverse response with temperature, as you'd expect, but a, a positive response with rainfall. They like wet environments and cold temperatures. The more tropical uh, savanna species also likes uh, wetter climates. This is precipitation of the, the, the maximum precipitation of the wettest month, but it, it seems to like higher mean annual temperatures, more tropical. Just bearing that in mind briefly. So here's the ground truth thing. There are data that exist. The blue symbols are historical records, and the white squares are recent um, collecting done by students and myself in the South Pinsburg Mountains. The green represents these very patchy remnants of the, of the, of the grassland biome, the Sauerfeld grassland. And in red is Otomus auratus and blue. So here the symbols are showing historical collection. Particularly I'm pointing out this locality here in the central Drakensburg, where Austin Roberts collected back in 1923, 90 years ago, and he collected predominantly the grassland species at 1,300 meters. In red there of just eight animals. These are very trap-shy animals. So after 17 trap nights, he got eight animals. But they were majority the grassland species, and then two of them were Angoniensis. And Agoniensis was found historically on the foothills here, whereas Otomus auratus was found at Interbeni. So we went back and we sampled in the western Sotpansberg, the Juma Buzzard Mountain, the highest points in the pristine grassland. We resampled at Punch Bowl. After nine nights, we got four animals. All of them were Agoniensis. So the, the grassland species appear to be extinct there now. But at Interbeni, we got two animals that were the grassland, Otomus auratus. So, just to give you another perspective, if we sort of go back in time, I don't know how close, clearly you can see this. This is an aerial photograph from 1951 of the Punch Bowl, the area. This is the hotel that was called the Punch Bowl. It's on the N1. It's now called the Vokavale, and this was probably where Austin Roberts collected in 1923. And this is where we collected just about two kilometers away at a wetland nearby. And you can see how it was a very, very open environment then, basically grasslands. And now if we look at it, modern 
map. You can see particularly in these slopes here, it's very bush encroached, thick, uh, very thick bush. So there's been quite a change in terms of bush encroachment. These are just, this is an old postcard, pre-war, probably the same time as when Austin Roberts was there, showing this peak by the hotel with open grasslands and planted trees along this road that now is the N1. And then this is the same area now, very, uh, it's, it's, it's a fun of vegetation. So it's hard to disentangle the effects of vegetation versus whether it's a thermoregulatory response that we are now finding a savanna species that seems to have invaded, if you like, right to the highest peaks of the grasslands in the South Pansburg. As the models, I point, must point out, sort of did pr predict. The other example I'm going to use are forest shrews, um, Myosaurix. There's five species currently recognized. So the most widespread, the green vertical lines, is the forest shrew, Myosaurix varius, which is a grassland species occurring along the escarpment and also in Feinbos. Myosaurus kafer, the dark-footed, it's a forest specialist. It occurs mostly in KwaZulu Natal and Eastern Cape. These populations indicated here by these IUCN maps are probably spurious. We haven't got recent um, confirmed records from here of Myosaurus kafer. And Sandy Willows Munro and her PhD, all the samples she took for genetics indicated they were varius. The third species is Slateri, which is a coastal Zululand coastal um, forest species. And then we have very rare uh, longicordatus, Myosaurix longicordatus, found in only five forest patches in mostly protected areas in the, in the Western Cape, going to the Nisner area there. So then there's a species of which very little is known called Myosaurix tenius, which is probably not a good species. Sotmansburg populations have always been enig enigmatic. Different authors have given them different names. You see these maps exclude them completely. But the latest, um, I think Friedman and Daly, the red data book, called them CAFA. So just to put it in perspective, we published recently from genetic and other data with Sandy willows Mundro, we show that the Popa populations are a distinct species, evolved, diverged from Myosaurix varius 2.7 million years ago, at the same time that Scleteri, the Zululand species, diverged from CAFA. So it's a good species which we wanted to model separately. So very briefly, this is now the forest specialist, Myosaurus kafer. We only use points from verified records, from where we have genetic or other data. And this shows you the current distribution and 2050 under the A2 scenario, where we expect a kind of a 27% loss in the area of occurrence. So it's currently near threatened, but we possibly should upgrade that to vulnerable because of ongoing habitat contraction. And habitat transformation, I think many of you here in Natal are aware of these land cover maps. In a very short space of time, you can see this is where the bulk of the distribution is of Myosaurus kafer in the Midlands and coast, and much of it's transformed. And these are species relying on um, forest, Midland forest and coastal forest and scarp forests. The, the very widespread Myosaurus varius occurring in grassland and Feinbos, we find by 2050, Quite a radical loss in area and contraction of its range. Um, and it was classified as near threat concern, but it might have to be, we might consider upgrading it based on, on these sort of changes that we might expect from future climate change. Also, the fact that Sandy Willows Monroe has identified the fact that the southern and northern populations are distinct genetic lineages. So, this new Limpopo species, which still has yet to have a name, it's, this is its current model distribution. It's endemic to Limpopo. And we don't see much change, even at perhaps a gain. Remember, it's subtropically located. But why this should increase in its range is not very really clear. Currently, it's near threatened. I, I know it's not evaluated, sorry. But it should be probably flagged as near threatened. This coastal forest specialist, Myosaurus sclatri from Zululand, Maputo land, um, the, the models will tell us it's, it, it's a subtropical species, its range will increase. Of course it won't because these things have very low dispersal capabilities, so that supposed increase won't happen. It's currently near threatened, it's endemic to KwaZulu Natal, and um, these apparent gains in suitable habitat are not going to be realized, and as we've seen, a lot of the habitat is being transformed. Finally, this is Longicordatus, a very, very rare species known from just a couple of localities, only described in the 1970s, by Nico Dipponar, it's a temperate forest specialist. And by 2050, this poor thing is hanging on um, by a thread. <laughs> so it should really be flagged. It's currently vulnerable, but it should be 
um, upgraded, in, given that these are the threats to, well, it's a real threat to its existence. So, in a nutshell, flay rats seem to follow the predictions um, with evidence for historical declines in the central Sotbansberg in the last 90 years. And we find greater contraction for the grassland and the fainbos compared to the savanna species. Again, precipitation seems to be more important, I forgot to say that, but the last refuge for, for the flay rat, the grassland species, seems to be the interbelly area, thanks, of the Sotbansberg, which is the wettest point in this country, has a precipitation including mist of around three meters, so it's possible that rainfall was the, one of the important variables. It's possible that rainfall more than, or uh, more importantly than temperature, maybe is important for, for the species that's allowing it to hang on there. So, once again, all museum records, very, very valuable, and the taxonomy is so important. Some of these small mammals, when we look at them with molecular data and, and other more closely morphological data, we find that they're, they're species complexes and that some of these component species have very restricted distributions. Um, we did find that the, shrew spe that the habitat specialists s suffered greater ra expected range ex contractions than the generalists. Um, so, but even in the case of a so-called common generalist like Mice or Oxvarius, the future is potentially bleak, particularly when we see what's happening to a lot of our wetlands, which they are very dependent on. And the subtropically distributed taxa, um, the, the suitable habitats are predicted to increase, although that won't be realized. And I think in terms of red listing, we will take cognizance of these potential climate change impacts. So thanks. That's all I have to say.